Good morning. Welcome to our worship service, both in person and online. As usual, let us now in silence uh, prepare our hearts to worship God. A call to worship this morning is taken from Psalms 96, 11 to 13. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes. For He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we heed the psalmist's call to be glad and to rejoice. Together with your creation, we come and praise your name. And we await your return to judge the earth and rule over us. We thank you for your first coming in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he has ushered in your already but not yet kingdom. But now, we await his return to bring it to completion. We thank you that in our present worship this morning, we can have the privilege of rehearsing our praises to you as though it is in heaven. To help us to be glad and rejoice as we bring our praises to you. Be pleased with it. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now invite the worship team uh, to lead us in worship. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here, and uh, we welcome everyone, even those who are watching online, uh, even on recording, uh, uh, as uh, I know that people are busy. And we know that uh, as long as we sort of set aside time, make sure we set aside time for God, um, that's sort of the important thing. Um, but of course, we do want to commune or uh, come together to, to worship. So let's rise as we prepare our hearts to listen to the message today. So this song is uh, relatively new, or actually quite new to our congregation, and um, it's called Shadow Step. Um, and the chorus, uh, the, this part is the chorus, it goes something like this. Light up the way of your heart, move me like you do the mountains. Move me like you do the wind And I'll chase your voice Through the dark For the eyes of the unexpected In the wonder of your shadow step So take another step You met me at the sinner's table I found you waiting by the well Unexpected You are always there Tracing all my steps so light up the way of your heart. Move me like you do the mountains. Move me like you do the wind. And I'll chase your voice through the dark. 
Fix my eyes on the unexpected In the wonder of your shadow step So take another step Your mercy paves the road ahead Unexpected You are always good You are always good your heart move me like you do the mountain move me like you do the wind and I'll chase your voice through the dark fix my eyes on the unexpected in the wonder of your shadow step and I won't be in every way you never fail so have your way dear God I'll sing your praise fix my heart to yours ready for the unexpected Ready for what you will do next I can't explain your heart Or dare to trace out all you are But when I think about the road you took for love I know your grace will stay the path light up the way light up the way of your heart move me like you do the mountains move me like you do the wind I'll chase your voice through the dark Fix my eyes on the unexpected In the wonder of your shadow step And I won't be afraid In every way you never fail So have your way praise fix my heart to yours ready for the unexpected ready for what you will do next so take another this king of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with each hearing of his softly spoken words my conscience a reminder 
of forgiveness that I need. Who is this King of glory who offers it to me? Who is this King of angels? Oh, blessed Prince of Peace. Revealing things of heaven And all its mysteries My spirit's ever longing For his grace in which to stand Who is this King of glory? Son of God and Son of Man His name is Jesus Precious Jesus Lord Almighty King of my heart King of glory Who is this King of glory With strength and majesty And wisdom beyond measure The gracious King of kings The Lord in earth and heaven The creator King of glory, he's everything to me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. Lord of earth and heaven. The Lord of earth and heaven, the creator of all things. He is the king of glory. He's everything to me. His name is One more time. His name is His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. sun that fills the sky, the story holds that lies the night, reflecting your glory, the mountain heights forever stand, the rain that falls to soak the land. Respond to your glory, Almighty God, in every way. You are above and beyond understanding. If we did not 
our praise. The rocks would cry out, glory is God, high above understanding. The vast expanse of earth and sea, held by you in harmony, speaks of your glory. All you've made since time began. Life itself, your perfect plan. It's all for your glory and almighty God in every way. You are above and beyond understanding. We did not pray. With my love, and glory is God, high above understanding. Creation joins as one to sing. What a glory is God, so far above all earthly God. And Almighty God, in every way, you are above and beyond understanding. If we did not pray, the rocks would cry out. And glory is God, high above Almighty understanding. God. Almighty everyone let's uh, let's take a bit of time to uh, meet and greet Good morning, those who are worshipping with us online. All right, uh, let us get back together.
Let us continue our worship with our tithes and offering. Uh, the protocol still remains unchanged. Please put your offering in the envelope provided and drop it off into the little chapel offering box as you leave the sanctuary through the side door over here. For those who are worshipping with us online, uh, as usual, you can either drop off your check in the church mailbox and call the church office to collect it, or you can mail it directly to the church address. Let us now reflect upon the words of Jesus in Acts 20, 35, which he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us pray. Father God, all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours, and we acknowledge that every good thing and blessing comes from you. Accept our offering as we give out of what you have blessed us with for the furtherance of your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I refer you to the church bulletin uh, for the announcement. As usual, first of all, a warmest welcome to all of you who are worshipping with us this morning, both online and in person. Next, we want to rejoice with Eric and Stephanie for the arrival of their daughter, Avery, on May the 14th. So do remember to congratulate them. And the same go to uh, um, Philip and Vivian as well for the arrival of their daughter, Ella, on May the 17th. Do remember to congratulate them. We will continue to read the Gospel of Mark after we finish the book of Matthew. As, you, as we all know, our church has started a Bible reading campaign, reading one chapter daily, beginning with the Gospel of Matthew. So do join us in reading God's Word together. Now there will be a Mandarin evangelistic meeting on Friday, May the 27th, uh, that is this uh, coming Friday at 7.30 p.m. Please invite your Mandarin-speaking friends uh, to attend. This year, uh, Vacation Bible School Monumental will be held Tuesday, August 2nd to Saturday, August the 6th. Regist registration is now open and been accepted. And the camp is, op basically the VBS is open for uh, children ages 5 to 12. So parents, if you uh, please check your email for the registration form sent to you. And if you, don't, if, if you do not receive it, uh, you can reach out to, uh, to uh, this uh, Stephanie and, or How right, uh, at uh, vixcacchildrenministry at gmail.com. Also, if you are interested in uh, volunteering to help out in the Vacation Bible School, you can contact them as well. Okay. Uh, there is an update actually in the, uh, the Baochong Alliance Church in Taiwan, so do spend some time in, in reading them. Right. Thank you. Today, we have come to uh, what people call a boring passage. Okay. Now, in a, as, a, as a way of introduction, we all know that in a typical movie, that is a section that most viewers would want to skip. And that is the credits of names at the end of the movie. And now here is a typical one. It's okay if you cannot see the name because that's not the point, right? <laughs> uh, so there's a credit of names given at the end of the movie. The list of names can go on and on for minutes, you know, in a well-developed movie uh, for different roles that these people play, 
you know, actors, directors, you know, uh, stage, uh, animation, you know, choreography, stunts, and so on and so on. And today in Nehemiah chapter 3, we have similar list of names recorded. Nehemiah knows the importance and the value of accurate records. The lists are not boring displays of names. They actually preserve the story of heroic people who played a part in rebuilding the gates and the walls of Jerusalem, which is the first aspect of rebuilding the people of God. Let us now hear the reading of these names. I know this is the boring part. And their contribution to the project. As I read the passage, do take note of the various gates highlighted in red and take note of the highlighted phrase next to him and next to them. Okay. I will get to it uh, later on as to what it really means. Now, my pronunciation beside the those uh, uh, what I call uh, long-established uh, pronunciation, like uh, Nehemiah, you know, the way that I pronounce it in the English way. Uh, but for most of the names, I will be pronouncing it in as close as possible to the Jewish way of pronunciation of the vowels and, and so on. So, um, do... Uh, Pay attention to the Word of God, even though it seems boring. Okay. Right. Nehemiah chapter 3. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Take note of that. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the, of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zaku, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its door his boats and his bars. And next to them, Mary Mort, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakos, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshezavel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Baana, repaired. And next to them, the Teko, the, sorry, the Tekoids repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Joiada, the son of Pasea, and Meshulam, the son of Besodea, okay, repaired the gate of Yeshana. They laid his beams and set his doors, his boats and his bars. And next to them repaired Melatia, the, the, the Gibeonite, okay. And Jadon, the Maronotite, the man of Gibeon, and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province, beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Hahiah, goldsmith, repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the per perfumers, repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad well. Sorry, broad wall. Next to them, Rephaiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerus sorry, Jerus Jerusalem, repaired. By the way, the son of Hur is actually Ben Hur. Remember the name? Ben Hur. Ben is son. So it's the son of Hur is Ben Hur okay, in Hebrew. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumaf, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hatush, the son of Hashabeneah, 
repaired. Melchia, the son of Harim, and Hasub, the son of Pahab Moab, repaired another section and a tower of the ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zanoah repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set its door, its boats and its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the Dung Gate. Remember, Dung Gate is the refuse gate or the garbage gate. Melchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of the district of Ben Hakaram, repaired the Dung Gate. He rebuilt it and set its door, its boats and its bars. And Shalom, the son of Kohob, Sorry, Kohose, ruler of the district of Mitzpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set his door, his boats and his bars. And he built the wall of the pool of Shelah of the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son, the son of Asbuk, ruler of half the district of Bethzo, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool, and as far as the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites repaired. Rehum, the son of Bani, next to him, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Keilah, repaired for his district. After him, the brothers repaired. Just somehow forgot the uh, consonant for the, the V, okay? Uh, ba, ba, vai, okay? This should be Vav, okay? Bavai, ba, the son of Hanadat, ruler of half the district of Keila. Next to him, Ezra, the son of Yeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zavai, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashiv, the high priest. After him, Merimot, the son of Uriah, son of Hakos, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashiv to the end of the house of Eliashiv. After him, the priests, the men of the surrounding area, repaired. After them, ben Benjamin and Hasuf repaired opposite the house. After them, Azariah, the son of Maaseiah, son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. After him, Benui, the son of Hanadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah, to the buttress and to the corner. Palai, sorry, Palai, the son of Uz, Uzai, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower of projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Padaya, the son of Parosh, and the temple servant living on Ophel, repaired to the point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoids repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Emer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shema, Shemaiah, the son of Shekaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shalamiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Melchiah, one of the goldsmiths, 
uh, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the master gate and to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. The word of the Lord. As I promised, you have read through the ten gates that is mentioned here in chapter 3. Now, sorry, here is a picture uh, of that. I think it's a little bit clearer than the last one, right? Uh, maybe just try. So basically, starting from... Starting from the sheep gate to the fish gate and to the old gate or the gate of Yashana, which is meaning old. And uh, that is it's possible that this might be the location of the gate, okay? But it is, uh, the location is actually unknown. Um, it's around this area. And then uh, we just take it as the Mishneh gate here, okay, according to this map. And then down to the valley gate and to the dung gate. And, uh, Fountain Gate, Up the Water Gate, the Horse Gate, East Gate, Master Gate, and back to the Sheep Gate. Run round. So this is the repairing, uh, repairing sequence. Okay. Uh, at the same time, there are two batch of uh, repairing uh, of builders. The first batch basically start from, of course, the Sheep one, and followed by him next to him, next to him, next to him. You know. So they at the same time they are doing all the repair. Okay, up to this portion where the first group of people, the priest, Ilya Shif, you know, uh, repeated some of the re uh, rebuilding section at the last lap of the, the, the sequence. Right. Now, there are different emphases on presenting the message of Nehemiah chapter 3. There are many who spiritualize a message based on the meaning of the names of either the gates or the builders. But a careful examination of the record of the builders and their specific assignments of the record of the build, uh, 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 the specific re assignment reveals, actually reveals eight, well, eight, eight, <laughs> okay, right. eight ideals, principles, and priorities that characterize their work for God. I believe this approach is more consistent to Nehemiah's purpose of not rebuilding the walls and gates, not just rebuilding the walls and gates of Jerusalem, but the lives of the people of God in Jerusalem. Nehemiah's purpose is to build up the spiritual lives of the people of God in Jerusalem, not so much the walls and the gates. So let's dive into the characteristics of God's servant. The first characteristics of God's servant is priority. The least tells us who started to work and where the work began. We read, Eliashiv, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, uh, and they built the ship gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. Rightfully, it was proper that the high priest of Jerusalem and his co-workers should set a good example to everyone else by starting out first. Spiritual leaders are required to do something more than just talking. The example of their daily life is actually their sermon. These Jerusalem priests wanted to be as good as their message, so they committed themselves eagerly to the work and in doing so encouraged the enthusiasm of their neighbours that the rebuilding project should start at the sheep gate 
is also plainly symbolic. It is saying, put God first. Being close to the northeast corner of the wall, this gate provided easy access to the temple. And this gate is named Sheep Gate because it took its name from the animals brought through it for sacrifices of worship in the temple. By beginning with building the Sheep Gate, it, Nehemiah is actually saying, in other words, put God first. Graphically, it is the same as Jesus commands to his followers. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The priest's priority is clear. They consecrate it and they dedicate this first section to the glory of God. And in doing so, they exemplify and encourage the commitment of all the others. Brothers and sisters, leaders of the church, what comes first or where is your priority in ministry service? The second characteristic of God's servant is unity. The priests were enthusiastic by beginning with the rebuilding, but they cannot do it all on their own. The success of the project depends totally on working as a team. There were obviously people from a wide variety of backgrounds, traits, expertise, you know, and, and skill levels. The project will fail if they cannot work harmoniously with each other. Nehemiah records for us throughout the chapter their harmonious working relationship. It says, next to him, next to them, and next to him. You know, and it keep on repeating that kind of phrasing. Now, it is not especially clear in the English um, version of the Bible but in the Hebrew and in the Septuagint, the Old Testament Greek, um, the, sorry, the Old Testament in Greek, it is literally, you know, translated as such. Next to him is translated as over his hands. Okay, and in the Hebrew word itself, ayad, sorry, ayada, sorry, ayado, okay, ayado. And next to them, Ayadam, okay? Basically, it's translated as over his hand, over the hand. And in the Greek, it is the same way too. Over, you know, his hand, okay? And over their hand. And you keep on repeating in that way. Basically, they are saying the people are working hand in hand beside each other. That means they are working in partnership. They are working, cooperating with one another. When finished, the rebuilt wall was a testimony to the workers' interdependent uh, partnership. All of us are not meant to live by ourselves. We all need supportive and edifying partners. Division and faction is one of, the, one of the most tragic things to happen in the life of a local church, which deviates from God's standard. Jerusalem's new walls were only possible because of cooperative teamwork. Brothers and sisters, despite our differences, we are called to work together in harmony for the glory of God. Let us continue our Christian service with the mentality of our walk as one or our start as one you know, team uh, for our church. Let us continue to work harmoniously together as one. 
The third characteristic of God's servant is individuality. Although the people work harmoniously together, they were all individuals, gifted in different ways by God. This is indicated by the many different names mentioned in Nehemiah's list. There is, however, four people who had same names. Okay. Uh, they are Meshulam, Makiah, Nehemiah, and Hananiah. But they were not the same persons. The only way to differentiate them is to mention their family background. Let's take a look quickly. So we have here in verse 4, right? Meshulam, the son of Barakiah. Okay, and now uh, here in, in the next verse, Meshulam, the son of Basodea, different person, but with the same name, right? Then we have another list. We have Melchiah, the son of Harim, and down the next verse, Melchiah, one of the goldsmiths, okay? Different person. And here we have Nehemiah, the son of Asbuk. Okay, uh, this is different from our author, Nehemiah, which is Nehemiah, the son of Hakai. Hak, sorry, sorry, how do you spell? <laughs> Hakalia, sorry. Right? That is our author, Nehemiah. So two men building on the walls may have the same name, but they are not the same person. They have contrasting personalities, complementary abilities, and distinctive gifts. Their unity is essential, but their individuality is totally valued by God. Throughout the scripture, God uses different people with different temperaments to achieve his purposes. God's servants are not all cast in the same mold. People with very, uh, varying gifts can perform complementary tasks. Let us be careful not to demand our individual members to be conformed to a same mode of ideals and methods and thereby devaluing their individuality. Remember the slogan, unity is not conformity. The fourth characteristic of God's servant oops, is unselfishness. The team of workers comprised of Jewish people from a variety of different locations throughout the region. It was not just the citizens of Jerusalem, but people from eight different places up to a 32 kilometers radius outside the city. According to Nehemiah's record, these volunteers came from uh, Jericho, from Tekoa, Gibeon, Mizpah, uh, okay, uh, Zanoah, Beth Hakarem, Beth Zu, and Keila. Different places. Now, there was no benefit to them whether or not the walls of Jerusalem were repaired. They had to look after their own fields, their own farms, their own shop, but they left their homes and families in order to offer themselves for service in the rebuilding project. It was work which could benefit those who live in Jerusalem far more than themselves. But the unselfish partnership is exemplary to all who serve in God's kingdom. It is an example which has been followed by the people of God across the centuries. Every week, millions of Christians sacrificially donate money for projects they will never see. They are content to give solely because they want to be a blessing to others. 
Dedicated prayer partners spend hours of their time earnestly praying for some countries they will never visit and intercede for years for missionaries they may not know. These people share eagerly in ventures which bring no personal benefit to them other than the privilege of doing it for our Lord. But Nehemiah made a special mention about a reali realistic exception. And that is, among all the people in their town who came rushing to volunteer their service, the leading citizens, the nobles, would not stoop to serve their Lord. These nobles were well aware of the need, but they resolutely refused to help. Other people from that town gave their services freely, but these nobles had no intention of dirtying their hands and put their shoulders to the work. This is a good contrast to the unselfish characteristic of God's servant. Let us all decide today that we will serve God unselfishly and for His glory and for the furtherance of His kingdom. Now, the fifth characteristic of God's servant is commitment. Nehemiah Lee continues to provide abundant evidence of men and women who committed themselves sacrificially to the project. First off, wholehearted service came from those Jerusalem citizens who were allocated a section of the wall within sight of their own homes. Right. One man made repairs opposite his house, right. another opposite his chamber, and um, two others make repairs beside their own house, while a number of priests work each opposite his own house. These people definitely would not be tempted to do shoddy work because they would be looking at that section of the wall they rebuilt every time they went in and out of their own homes. Hence, they would be determined to bring their best to it because they did not want you know, to present work you know, uh, that will bring them future embarrassment. Brothers and sisters, we covered your commitment in serving your own church, in serving Victoria Chinese Alliance Church. Secondly, committed sacrificial service was rendered by men and women who threw themselves into the enterprise even though they were totally lacking in experience as builders and laborers. Nehemiah especially mentions citizens who were skilled in other occupations. People are not accustomed to the physical work involved in building construction. Experienced builders must have been on site who could show priests, okay, goldsmiths, um, perfume makers, merchants, and district rulers how to build their section of such a massive wall. And these people were fully prepared to leave their lucrative profession for an undefined period to engage in the grueling work which would test their physical resources to the limit. Nehemiah was favoured to have been given such a devoted team. Without this passage, their identity would never be known. But the surviving record is a reminder that individuals before God matter in the Lord's work. The church over the centuries has been enriched by the ministry of these committed believers whose prim primary incentive was to honour God. They were ready to do anything 
anything which would further God's cause, whether be it cleaning, food catering, flower arrangement, building repairs, home visitation, you know, leaflet and gospel tract distribution, and scores of you know, other tasks. All of it have been done for God's glory and other people's good. And that was reward enough. Let us pray that we will one day be that group of committed believers who will do all things to glorify God. The sixth characteristic of God's servant is enthusiasm. The people did not merely start the work, they kept at it. We have already seen that some people completed their part of the war and then went on to work just as enthusiastically on another section. We read, Mary Maud completed one part and then repaired another section in verse 21. And Meshulam, in verse 4, did the same and he went on to repair another section uh, in verse 30. At the same time, the man of Dekoa, refusing to be influenced by the bad example of the arrogant nobles, remember them? Also had two main sections, in verse 5, right? And also in verse 27, to their credit. Thank God for those who have been eager to go the second mile in God's work. O oh Lord, we do pray that you help us to have that same enthusiasm in our service and ministry in the church. The seventh characteristic of God's servant is privilege. All the workers mentioned by Nehemiah regarded their work not as a grueling chore, but as a priceless opportunity. God had done so much for them. And this was their chance to do something entirely for him. Service was a privilege, and especially so for some of the team who had made serious mistakes in the past. Because now they have been given an opportunity to demonstrate publicly their renewed devotion and complete surrender. We read of one, Melchia, Melchia, or Melchia, son of Harim, in verse 11, was one of those men who had married a foreign wife and had been convicted of wrong under Ezra ministry 13 years earlier. Okay, uh, the second part is from passage in Ezra, chapter 10. Right? Uh, at the bottom of this is all these had married foreign women and some of the women had even home children. Now, I, it's, there is no time for us to mention what kind of sin they committed by marrying uh, foreign women. Okay? Uh, it, is a, it will be another sermon. Okay? <laughs> right? But basically, during extra time, okay, it was a mistake that they made. Then we read of Mary Maud, son of Uriah, was another worker with a sad ancestry. His grandfather, Hakos, had been excluded from the priesthood because he could not prove his descent from Israel, likely due to a mixed marriages between uh, northern Israel, between Israel, okay, and uh, the, the neighbours from the, all the other foreign, uh, from the neighbouring nation. As a result, we have the Samaritans coming out uh, from, from the mixed marriage. So likely, they are from that descent and they cannot prove their actual descent. Okay. Um, so they were excluded uh, from being priests. But Mary Moore's father, Uriah, had become a priest and under Ezra, his son, was entrusted with the traveller's silver, gold and the sacred articles. Now, past failures do not inhibit present grace. Many of Corinth's new Christians came into the church life from an immoral background, and the Apostle Paul did nothing to hide it. 
His exposure was not to embarrass them, but to exalt the Christ who died for them. Those sexual offenders, alcoholics, thieves and slanderers have been washed by the Lord Jesus and sanctified, that is, consecrated, right, set apart as his transformed witnesses in an alien society. So that is grace. In our own way, whatever our background, whatever our mistake, whatever our bad experiences, we must count it as a privilege to serve our gracious God. And lastly, the eighth characteristic of God's servant is reward. Under Nehemiah's inspiring leadership, work on the wall got off to an excellent beginning. But the days ahead were not easy. There were severe hazards and inevitable discouragement. Yet as the weeks went by, this large team recognised that they were building something which they could dedicate to the glory of God. And we read of that in Nehemiah chapter 12. Their greatest reward was to work together amicably and leave something behind which would outlive their days. In time to come, the workers died, but the walls would remain. Their good work would stand the test of time. The walls of Jerusalem would survive as an honoured monument, not to the builder's fervour, but to the Lord's faithfulness. God has inspired their beginning, encouraged their continuance, and effected their completion to succeeding, to succeeding generations. Those walls would be vocal. Their stones would cry out, just like the song goes just now. The, the stone would cry out with a message evident to all. Without God, such a visible reality would have remained an untenable dream. It is a magnificent thing when a Christian believer can leave something behind in this world which testifies to God's goodness in our human life. So the following eight qualities char characterizes the servant's work for God. Priority, unity, individuality, unselfishness, commitment, enthusiasm, privilege, and reward. Let us all try to learn and exercise all of it to serve God for His glory. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come and close us with a praise song. Thank you, Pastor Feng. Um, let's all rise as we uh, finish off, the, I guess, the, the service with this uh, response song here. now to follow him 
to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. There in the garden of tears, my heavy load he chose. standing and receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. Be seated, please. After a moment of silent prayer and meditation, you may be dismissed. Go forth and serve the Lord.